Hello, everyone. My name is Bernike Hermann, and together with Julia Grisot, we are presenting part of our research on Swiss literature. Today, we're talking about a well-known figure in literary discourse around the globe, and we're asking whether Heidi really is happier in the mountains. To answer this question, uh, question uh, we are um, uh, using computational methods. So our research was or uh, is being conducted within the project High Mountains, Low Arousal, Distant Reading, Topographies of Sentiment in German novels and German Swiss novels in the early 20th century, um, which was funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation uh, during three or four, uh, for three years, um, uh, and uh, who just, uh, yeah, was finalized. And we are just presenting um, part of our research, uh, which is still ongoing. Um, so to give you an impression of Heidi, you're probably all familiar with this figure and, and the story of the figure of the character. Here is a little ex ex extract from, uh, the book from a let later part of the book, um, which I'm going to read out as a bird, when it first finds itself in its bright new cage, does hither and thither, trying the bars in turn to see if it cannot get through them and fly again into the open. So Heidi continued to run backwards and forwards, trying to open first one and then the other of the windows, for she felt she could not bear to see nothing but walls and windows, and somewhere outside there must be the green grass and the last unmelted snows on the mountain slopes, which Heidi so longed to see. So already from this e extract, you can see that there are uh, specific um, patterns in which the topographies, which we understand as landscapes or space in the fiction, um, are depicted and uh, in which in uh, ways in which they are actually encoded effectively or by evoking uh, emotions. So let's um, jump into another survey which we didn't conduct, but which we kind of um, put into our back ground theory or, um, uh, or general approach here, which is uh, a national um, survey which was conducted in 2015 um, uh, for, by the Swiss authorities, looking at um, many aspects of uh, Swiss identity, also asking this question, which we see here, which events or person personalities are important to Switzerland's identity? And we can see that Heidi actually um, uh, comes in at fifth place just after Willem Tell. So we see that Heidi as a fictional character has made its way into the, yeah, uh, the real world, the everyday world of people, um, and even into identifying, uh, you know, has a role for identification of citizens and inhabitants of S Switzerland, together with another iconic uh, character, Wilhelm Tell. So this in part already answers the question, why Heidi? Why do we look at Heidi uh, in, in particular? Because in our research, we apply distant reading, which is normally run on bigger um, collections of text of, on, on digital corpora. Um, Heidi, uh, in a way, is a specific use case, which is in a way iconic. Um, it was published in, first published in 1880, 81, so many years ago, uh, but since then it has evolved to be one of the most popular or the most popular Swiss novel and literary character as we just saw um, within Switzerland and beyond Switzerland. So it ranges among, among the most, the best-selling books of all times around the globe. So why is that, right? I mean, being empirical literary scholars, we ask why such success could have happened. And uh, we arrived together with um, the literature research on Heidi and children's literature, literature all together, of, uh, which of course Heidi is, is an example. Um, at um, yeah, at the at the at the finding that um, the text reassuringly simplifies reality and it creates a world made um, of polarizations. So you have the good and the bad. And for us, interestingly, um, for our project. Um, these polarizations, these contrasts, uh, run along uh, the difference of, of types of landscape. So we have a, an urban environment and we have a, a rural and a, and a natural landscape, which are um, 
contrasted. So, and uh, that's that's not all, but these uh, landscapes are also uh, encoded in terms of effect or value on um, the, the characters that uh, experience um, events and uh, which are depicted psychologically uh, have emotions, they undergo effects. And um, there is good reason to believe in the literature on Heidi, on the hermeneutic literature on Heidi, that there is a good um, uh, encode, uh, it's an encoding of, of the good in uh, rural life and natural life, as opposed to the bad urban life uh, as part of um, capitalism and uh, industrialization taking hold. Um, interestingly enough, um, together with uh, the creation of Heidi, the a specific myth um, started to emerge in Switzerland beyond, of course, Heidi itself um, as just one children's book, which is the idealization of Switzerland as an enchanted, uncontaminated natural space. Uh, if one looks closely at the history of Switzerland, once he said this is really not the case, but that Switzerland was one of the first adapters to um, industrialization uh, in its own way. But um, Again, the question, why was Heidi such a success might uh, be answered, at least in part, by research that says, well, it's not just schematic there. It seems to be, you know, it seems to strike a balance between realism and sentimentality of, of a little bit of complexity um, and uh, within, within um, uh, the schematic way of telling things. And um, here's why, where we actually start um, our distant reading approach where we use spatial entities matching. Julia is going to tell you um, details about that, where we use lexicon-based sentiment analysis in order to run um, an automated analysis that asks about this dualism in Heidi. And this has two reasons. On the one hand, of course, we um, uh, could do this in close reading, of course, but we want to test, as I said, we have this, this larger project and with a larger uh, collection of texts, we want to test whether our method that we use on the, on the bigger corpus actually holds, whether we can validate it on a small text that is, of course, um, that people have read over and over um, and that we also have read in close reading, uh, which we know uh, as, a, as a holistic uh, unit. So, um, so we test our um, our method, whether does it find a prominence of natural space as opposed to urban, because it's supposed to, you know, uh, um, um, a story that depicts mostly alpine life. And the other question, which is also more empirical and open, is whether the polarization of good and bad in uh, relation to the landscapes is, is borne out by the analysis you know, um, uh, applying an, um, an empirical um, and um, as intersubjective or even objective procedure as possible. And then uh, the last question relates to what I said before. Um, is it, do we still find a schematic pattern despite the literary value that some people have pointed out? So um, it, for us, it is most of all a use case for validation of our sentiment analysis uh, we use Senti art um, and we validate it by uh, contrasting it to human annotations. So that's something that we did um, most of all, not just our close reading that is kind of um, in the background. Uh, what's in the foreground is human annotators who um, did a very controlled annotation uh, um, run uh, and annotated sentence by sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Berenice. Uh, I will now guide you through the methodology um, and the results of our study uh, on the spatial and the sentiment analysis of Heidi. Our exploration of the spatial dimension of the novel uh, began with the compilation of a comprehensive dictionary of spatial terms. Both named ones and non-named ones, uh, where named ones are terms such as Berlin, Donau or Zermatt, and uh, non-names would be uh, general common words like field, hat or palace. Uh, the final dictionary, uh, or spatial entity list as we refer to it, uh, had 170,000 uh, terms. And while we focused our analysis 
on the two bigger kind of um, categories of rural and urban, uh, then you can see uh, we actually had uh, some uh, subcategories that uh, you can see in our table, uh, and they were especially useful for us to operationalize the collection of these terms. Um, you can also see uh, in the distribution that can be seen in the other in the graph, just aside the table, that the, the distribution is not exactly normal. Uh, and uh, the reason is simply that uh, geolocations, so names of existing places, um, were much easier to collect and were pre-compiled lists that you can find online, whereas we had to make our own lists for non-named entities um, and uh, with the help with some Swiss German native um, student assistants. But uh, you will see that that doesn't necessarily affect the result. Um, what happened is then that um, when we applied this dictionary to um, Heidi and to the comparison corpus that we created, uh, that, that comprised more than 180 narrative texts, 184 to be specific, written in German in the same period when Heidi was written by 69 Swiss, Swiss authors, um, this allowed us to examine how many rural and urban entities were um, featured in these two corpora and also whether the distribution differed uh, between those two corpora. And here we are talking exclu exclusively of the spatial representation. Uh, in terms of sentiment, uh, we used SentiArt, as Berenike just said, uh, which is a very well-known sentiment analysis tool developed by our very own Arthur Jacobs, uh, and uh, that has used um, a very large um, language data set and BERT, uh, to, and which we have seen previously in our research, it performs way far better than many other um, pre-compiled lexicons, sentiment lexicons. Uh, what we Focus here specifically is the effective aesthetic potential measure, which has been uh, proved to correlate um, very nicely and to reflect uh, valid, uh, the valence, so how positive or negative pretty much a word is. Um, and uh, oh, so Sentiart is a very well-balanced uh, lexicon that has words that span from very negative to very positive and uh, more than 116,000 words that are uh, um, that have values for this sentiment. Uh, which also means that it typically has a very good coverage. So in our case, I think both for Heidi and for the corpus, uh, the coverage of Santiago was above 85%. Um, what happens in practice in this kind of analysis is that for every sentence, uh, every word detected, every word that is present in Santiago uh, gets a value for sentiment. And this value can be then averaged per sentence to obtain a, a sentiment value per sentence. So this happens for every sentence in both Heidi and the corpus. Uh, and this way we are able to compare the two. So what about the result? <laughs> well, in terms of space, uh, we were quite um, happy to see that our expectations were pretty much met in terms of um, the rural entities being much more numerous and much more frequent than the urban entities. And also in terms of uh, when, when you look uh, specifically at which terms were de detected, you can see that they are quite um, highly specific. So the first, the first, the most frequent terms for the rural categories for instance, are Hütte, Dörfli, Alm. So very, very typical um, Heidi uh, words. So the hat, uh, the little village, and uh, the alpine pasture. Uh, whereas on the other, uh, on the other side, on the urban side, also the very first, most dominant word is of course uh, Frankfurt, and Schule is there, where also Heidi spends quite some time. Uh, but again, the question was, uh, how does this distribution compare to other literary texts? Is this really highly specific? Uh, so what we did is that we um, proceeded exactly in the same um, way for the comparison corpus, where we can see that as a first, um, as a first trend, the, the distribution of rural and urban is actually similar. So again, we see quite a dominance of the of rural terms in comparison to urban ones um, in general on its own. Uh, you can see, however, that when looking at the specific terms that feature mostly, uh, maybe there isn't that kind of highly specificity that we saw before. Uh, but nonetheless, these visuals, of course, just give you an impression of what's happening. And uh, we really wanted to see whether statistically these two differed. 
Uh, and so we did uh, compute um, a Wilcoxon rank text for the two categories in the two corpora. Uh, and what happened and what we saw is that um, this difference was um, significant between the two corpus for the rural terms, uh, in meaning that rural, generally Heidi had significantly more rural entities than the comparison corpus, whereas no significant difference was detected for the urban ones. And also, in terms of the overall presence of spatial entities, Heidi had more. So there is more space in Heidi in, in general than there is in the comparison corpus. Uh, in terms of uh, the combination, the interaction between sentiment and space, as we have um, said previously, we wanted to see whether there is an effect in practice, an effect of the presence of space on the sentiment. So does does the mountain actually has, you know, for instance, a positive um, positive connotation or not? Does Frankfurt ha has a negative correlation? How we proceed in that respect is that for every sentence again, we could detect those um, spatial terms. And at the same time, we could detect the words uh, that are part of the sentiart um, lexicons. So therefore calculating for every single sentence, um, an average value of sentiment and also labeling that sentence either as rural or urban. And of course, there are cases in which a sentence contained both rural and urban terms. In those cases, that sentence would feature in both lists. So it would appear twice in our computations. Uh, and what we could see from this analysis is that, um, for instance, we could construct a sentiment arc of, uh, of uh, Heidi. And this emotional arc um, resembled very much one of the um, one of the arc proposed by Regan and colleagues uh, for for one of the type of stories, uh, which maybe is not necessarily surprising, but it does mean that uh, senti art um, does its its job in a way, um, and uh, it also reflects our expectations of Heidi as a, as an as a story because we know that. Heidi starts and ends in the mountains, but in the middle of the book, she's in Frankfurt. So this negative trend in the middle is actually exactly where, uh, pretty much where she's in, in the town. When looking at, uh, at, at the entities and this sentiart A uh, aesthetic value uh, as, as compared uh, individually, so the block, all the sentences that had rural and all the sentences that had urban uh, terms and comparing them in terms of sentiments, uh, there was a significant difference where rural sentences were significantly more positive than urban ones. Again, our question extended to the corporeal corpus. So we wanted to see whether this trend was also true there. So we did perform the exact same computation. And we did find that, yes, there was a significant correlation in the comparison corpus, but it was exactly the opposite, in the opposite direction. So the the urban sentences in the comparison corpus, well, I, I can see that the graph does not really show <laughs> that difference a lot, but the stats say that the difference is significant and highly significant. Um, so lastly, we, uh, as mentioned, we wanted to validate uh, the, the performance of Sentiart by comparing it with um, human annotators, human annotations. We had several annotators that overlapped in different period of times, you know, annotated annotations is a complex uh, and expensive uh, procedure. And we had different students uh, in different time frames. So they overlapped in different groups. The groups are referred to in this little table where you can see for every group the, the value of their interrelator agreement, the ICC. Uh, and so none of the group was really performing um, poorly. So the lowest is for 24, which maybe was, you know, not it's not excellent, but we decided to, uh, to keep all those uh, annotations anyway. Um, and what happened is that uh, when comparing the sentiment of course, after having normalized the, the senti and the senti art and the annotations, um, we, com we we put them together and we could see that there was a significant uh, robust correlation between the annotations that our student um, performed and the ones that were uh, found via uh, the senti art lexicon. 
uh, and the, we also were interested in uh, digging a little more qualitatively into how, when exactly, and how um, they differed. Why? Why was our specific sentences in disagreement between the students and uh, the Sentier lexicon, the, the value that the Sentier lexicon um, extracts? What we can see here, and these are the sentences that we um, collected as the ones that have the highest difference, so the ones that are the, the, the differ mostly in terms of the annotation between human and machine. What you can notice already here, and I'm just going to mention it, is that actually it's um, it's mainly single word exclamations or individual names or sentences that are generally very short and also therefore generally lacking in to in context so that's um that's something that uh, you might want to keep in mind um and with this i will uh hand over the word to berenike again okay um we had another question as i said in the beginning right um heidi is schematic julia said and and presented a lot of evidence uh which we um, find convincing and which we test statistically um, for Heidi being quite, quite uh, schematic and even, uh, not even, but also in comparison with a, with a reference corpus, a comparison corpus of Swiss literature written in Germany, uh, German, sorry, uh, and uh, published by Swiss authors at the same time, around the same time as Heidi was published. Um, but still, we take uh, we take um, seriously um, more fine grained analyses and and interpretations of literary scholars. So what we did then do in a, a small uh, qualitative study is look at um, specific places and uh, types of space uh, within Frankfurt with and you know at, in the part of the story that takes place in the in the big city and what we found among these uh, spaces and places is that the, the study the studierzimmer uh, seems to have a specific role which is encoded which opens up a space for the small girl to learn and to develop you know to um, open up uh, learn new ways uh, while studying and while interacting with people there in a friendly way. What we see here, I'm not going to read it out, but what we see here is an interaction with a grandma of, of um, the, the host's uh, daughter. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's a, we're looking at a, at a learned lady, uh, bourgeois lady, um, uh, highly educated, who has a benevolent uh, view on this child from the mountains and this wild child and who supports her. And all this happens mostly in the study. So the study, the Studierzimmer, seems to be a friendly space within the urban environment. Um, and uh, it, it is a space for learning. And uh, as you know, the, the whole uh, story shows, of course, that nature is a wonderful space for learning. Uh, but there seem to be like pockets within uh, the urban environment that uh, that uh, do the same. But and it seems to be important that Heidi has a degree of freedom within the study, within the Studierzimmer. And um, she kind of shakes up the situation a little bit by, for example, bringing in music, which hasn't been heard there in this way. She brings in a barrel organ player. She brings in an animal, a cat that uh, is, is quite wild in there. And she herself is, is being uh, an entity that is shouting, laughing and romping around in there. So she's she's doing her authentic, effective behavior and she has the support uh, within this uh, this space, uh, within the urban confinement. So that while the narrative is overall very schematic um, uh, at the at the highest level, looking at the whole text, um, and has a topographical schema that is stable and on which the effective value, the encoding is clearly mapped. Um, um, uh, we have these, these little hiccups and th these seem to make the, the story so interesting and seem to make it good children's prose. Um, and the sch schematicity of the whole um, narration seems to be part of the, of the su success in that it reaffirms this unambiguous message, uh, you know, um, uh, when you eventually. So it's not an ambiguous message in which, you know, we 
get to think about yeah is it good or bad or so to be in nature no we clearly have um get the message it's good to be in nature it's good to be authentic wild we have to connect ourselves to Heidi um so um uh, but it's it's enriched um uh, by this uh this is just what Julia said show before that that we have the study within this dip um we still have the study. So the study in terms of um, when we when we look at uh, the statistics at frequency, at the frequencies, it doesn't really count. So as to conclusions, um, as Julia just summed up in Heidi, there is altogether more space when compared to our comparison corpus. And of course, this being more spatial is easily um, related to children's literature as, as, as being you know, anchored and and being palpable and uh, more imageable uh, than than more abstract or more you know aesthetically uh, crafted uh, prose, but uh, this can also be interpreted as pointing towards landscape and space as a protagonist. You know, nature as a protagonist in in in, in Heidi. It's, this is part of interpretation. We just want to share this. So um, altogether. Um, Heidi features more rural terms than than uh, the comparison corpus. We have looked at that, so it's you know points to the first point. And then in terms of sentiment, um, the um, rural entities correlate also in comparison with um, the comparison corpus. Point to uh, uh, have uh, show uh, a positive um, correlation um with the rural entities show positive correlation with a positive encoding of sentiment so we have these these um statistical findings here which and now i'm coming to the last part which also show that we have a significant correlation between what the annotators did so people who sat down and went through the whole story sentence by sentence um, and this shows that uh, automatic analysis, is, which was a lexicon-based sentiment analysis, did more or less the same. We did see that the, that the dip was more pronounced for the human annotators, and that tells the story that that um, the automated automated analyses uh, can still be refined. And this leads to the very uh, last point on the slide. This specific lexicon that we used um, uh, is of course, not informed of the context uh, of, of the sentences. It runs on the sentences and that's that. Whereas the annotators, although they were instructed to look at concentrate on the sentences, they do of course bring in the context and they disambiguate. So this is uh, a venue for the research that we and other sentiment analysis uh, researchers uh, are venturing into. Here's our references and uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.